All right, good morning, everybody. We are back. Wednesday Bible study is back, and what a joy to be able to gather with you guys today. Uh, we always uh, sometimes begin with a great greeting like this. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we can do that every single day because of the good news. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And we get to stand in that Easter hope, Easter victory, Easter joy each and every day with everything going on in our world today and everything going on in our lives. The Lord is our solid foundation. He is our safe harbor. He's our anchor in the storm. And uh, what a blessing it is to gather with saints, with brothers and sisters in Christ, to spend some time in God's word today and, uh, and to grow in our faith and our walk with him. Uh, I'm going to start off with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to do some uh, kind of housekeeping details about our class, since this is our first one getting set up. Uh, but let's first go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, this is the day that you have made, Lord, and we truly rejoice and are glad in it. Uh, because you are our God. You are faithful and you are good. And you have displayed your love and mercy and your favor to us by sending your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who died and rose for us that we might have new life and eternal life in you. We also thank you for the gift of your word that leads us and guides us and directs us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we pray for your Spirit's presence with us today as, uh, as these words uh, that you have given to us, Lord. Shape us and guide us and fill us with hope and uh, with joy in you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to greet those of you joining us uh, online. Uh, each week, this Bible class is going to be recorded and posted about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And so maybe you're watching this on Wednesday afternoon or maybe you're watching it later in the week. Uh, it's always nice to have these that you can go back and watch an old one if there's something that you missed. Um, but we're very thankful for uh, you to be with us. This is a two-week topic that we're starting off with on the resurrection of the body and cremation, uh, a special topic that we're going to have these two weeks. That's going to be followed by a longer series as we're going to go through the book of Ephesians. Take a look at St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And that one will, that study is going to take us quite a bit longer, at least uh, to Christmas time, just so you guys know what's coming up. So this Bible study is in person and online. For those of you joining us in person, we have our time of fellowship. Uh, coffee and treats are going to be out about 10.30 on Wednesdays. You may have noticed, if you came around that time, we do overlap in the church a little bit with one of our music classes. Our students, uh, the handbell class, is just finishing up with Mr. Horak. And so he said it is no problem at all for you guys to come in set your things down, come into your seat. He said it's good for them to uh, uh, have some other adults in the room, uh, maybe make some stand up a little straighter and uh, play a little more focus, knowing they have an audience, and maybe you can get a little concert uh, for just those five to ten minutes that they're going to be in here when we arrive. Otherwise, you're uh, certainly welcome to enjoy coffee and treats either in here or in the lobby area, and we might add some seating out there as well if you'd like that. Um, you're welcome to bring coffee and treats here in the sanctuary for Bible study. Just be very mindful about the floor and about any spills because uh, with a sloped floor, you know just what happens if something spills back there, all the way up to the front. So just want to be mindful about that, but uh, certainly glad that we have this chance to fellowship together and be together. We are a masks welcome. Uh, so our, our church and school, our masks welcome. Uh, they are optional, and uh, we s continue to do our, our rigorous health protocol that we have, especially with our school ministry, with our, our social distancing and good ventilation. You'll see our doors propped open uh, on other sides of the building throughout the day. Uh, hand sanitizer is out there by the treats and coffee. Please make sure that you're washing your hands regularly, and people have been very good that if they're not feeling well, uh, stay home and uh, watch the online Bible class. So thank you so much for uh, the ways that uh, you've been really been helping us have a, a, a great experience these last several months, even with all our extra health protocols in place. Um, and of course, I uh, invite you to bring your Bibles and uh, bring your Bibles with you to Bible study. 
Uh, I mentioned our, our topic that we're going to look for at today. I did just want to make a special note and a little uh, commercial for our spiritual growth campaign that we're having here at Our Savior starting on September uh, 18th. It is over a book that should be familiar to you guys because we did this book in Wednesday Bible study. I am a church member. And uh, I don't know if you remember, as we went through this together, we said several times, whoa, this is stuff that we should do with the whole church. And so that's exactly what we're doing. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, those of you that have gone through the material get to sit this one out. (laughs) Um, It's actually the opposite. We're, we're counting on you guys to actually lean in. And, and you, have, you have more to share, perhaps, because you're more familiar with the material, maybe have some things already noted and underlined, and really looking forward to seeing how God blesses our church family, the bigger church family, with discussions about the book. Those are available out in the lobby if you uh, lost yours in the last few years uh, or need a new one or want to get one to pass it on. So I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, There is going to be small groups meeting, and there's also a Zoom small group. For those of you that would like to participate in a small group from the comfort of your own home, uh, and uh, if there's any other health concerns, there's a Zoom small group, and you can find more information about that through our communication channel. So just wanted to make a note about that. Well, our, uh, our topic for today and for next Wednesday, this two-part series, is the resurrection of the body and cremation. And this is a topic that has certainly been around and been discussed in the Christian church uh, for a number of years, but it's one that's very fitting for us to look at here at Our Savior because uh, we have something really important, really special happening in in our congregation uh, or on our our campus, on our property, I should say. Maybe you saw when you walked up today uh, just the, uh, the new installation that we have right outside these windows of the Memorial Garden. Uh, just a beautiful spot, a beautiful enhancement to our campus and, uh, and also stands as a statement of faith. The Memorial Garden stands as a testimony to the belief that we have as Christians in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And in the recent decades, I'll say decades because I know it certainly was happening when I first started ministry about 15 years ago, we noticed uh, an increase in the number of Christians who were choosing cremation as part of their uh, funeral and and end-of-life arrangements. Uh, At one point in my previous congregation, about 10 years ago, we noticed it was about 50-50 with our congregation. And and in recent years, I think that's probably grown to at least two-thirds, if not three-quarters, of the services that we do as pastors are for, uh, involve cremation as opposed to a traditional burial. Now, because this is not a long-standing practice in the Christian church, there are not a lot of customs and traditions and rites and ceremonies that go along with a memorial service, and so the church has had to do some reflection and some thinking and some putting together some thoughtful ways to go about that, to say, how does our Christian faith inform how we come together and how we uh, treat both the body, a burial, and how do we, again, profess our faith in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And that is certainly something that we want to make sure comes through in everything that we do, uh, that our faith informs and shapes our our decisions and our practices and our, our, uh, the way that we do life together. And that's what I hope we get to talk about here in this class. I remember talking with uh, Pastor Kumalo maybe uh, two years ago or so about the Memorial Garden when it was first being conceptualized. And he had a lot of questions about that. He said that is not something that was very common in Africa. And he had never done a service, a memorial service, where someone had been cremated. So he's asking different questions. Well, I started asking him questions about their practices. And it was fascinating to hear the variation and the variety of different burial practices and customs that they have in South Africa, which you can imagine are just different than than ours here. Um, He said that it was based on different groups or denominations. Every denomination or every religion had their way of burial, their way of going about it. Uh, One group, he told me, denomination, the people are buried in a white linen cloth. 
That's what they wear. All of them. Every time. Uh, another group, uh, the people are buried uh, vertically rather than horizontally. That was their distinction that they had. There was one group that buried the person with no clothes whatsoever, just stark bare like the day they were born. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I returned, says Job. They took that literally. So the customs were really different as he's describing these different burial practices. And uh, another interesting thing he said was, uh, even though there's all this variety, the churches come together and they agree on what they're going to do, and everyone does the same thing for that church. So he, couldn't, he was surprised that we had a variety in our own congregation. He said, that would never happen in Africa. The, the church would come together, say, what are we going to do, and then that's what would be done, because the community is of greater value than the individual. And in the United States, we really value individual choices, individual freedoms, and that takes more priority a lot of times over the, the community. And so we had a good discussions about all those things. And uh, it was fascinating to hear about that. And even though that's something that we certainly still maintain, and that's a hallmark of our American church, uh, this uh, personal choice and personal decisions, we want to affirm that. At the same time, we want to make sure we're giving good guidance for Christians because, again, there's not a long-standing practice. There's not a long tradition or, or different customs. And so that's why we provided the Memorial Garden is to help direct uh, believers who choose, do choose cremation to have a place where we can lay those saints to rest in a way that uh, recognizes our faith and hope that we have in Christ. So that's what we're going to look at uh, and we, as we do, go through this class in part one and part two. Part one is looking at our biblical foundations for the hope that we have in the resurrection of the body. And what do we believe happens you know, when we die and what does it mean to go to heaven? Uh, what does it mean to be raised up again? And God's word has some amazing, wonderful promises and assurances that he gives us in our Savior Jesus Christ. And then part two, next week, we'll look a little bit more at some of the more detailed customs, ceremonies, uh, faith practices that believers can have as we come together and mourn and grieve together, but as we do that with hope in our risen Lord. So that's kind of uh, how we're going to lay out our, our class as, uh, as part one and part two. Uh, we, I'm, I really am excited because we get to begin with just such a fundamental truth of the Christian faith. And this is the first line on the uh, handout. And for those of you joining us online, that handout will be posted uh, on our, our webpage for Bible study and made available. A fundamental truth that St. Paul expresses in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But in fact, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Our Christian faith about salvation, redemption, and eternal life is grounded in the historical event of Jesus' resurrection. His life, death, and resurrection are the foundation for our faith and our hope. In Christ we live, and apart from Christ we die eternally. This all hinges, everything that follows is going to hinge on Jesus' own resurrection from, from the dead. As St. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, worthless, and worst of all, we're still dead in our sins. But in fact, he says, Christ is risen from the dead. He's become the first fruits of them that have fallen asleep. And so our hope and our confidence is in the fact that Jesus overcame death and the grave for us. As Christians, we get to be Easter people, and we get to live every day like it's Easter morning with that good news of Jesus' resurrection, knowing that our Redeemer lives. And that's the basis for our Christian faith. We mention that in the creed. We mention that in a lot of statements of faith, in our songs, especially when a loved one dies and the congregation comes together to, to mourn and grieve, there's going to be a lot of focus and a lot of emphasis on Jesus' victory over death because Jesus' victory is our victory and we get to stand in, the, in his resurrection power. Now, there are obviously a lot of other alternatives and other different views that people have about an afterlife or about life after death or what happens when we die. Uh, we certainly acknowledge that. 
And we live in a society where there are many different uh, op uh, opinions and faiths and beliefs and so forth. And uh, we know that Christians are distinct, that we are, we are different. Uh, we have our own set of beliefs. Just to do a little uh, brief survey of some of the alternatives. You know, what are the alternatives to life after death? What do other faiths believe and teach? Well, for Muslims, who are probably the most similar to Christians and uh, also Jewish believers, in the sense that they believe in a final judgment uh, on the last day, uh, they actually believe that Jesus is going to come for the final judgment on the last day, uh, although they don't believe he's the Son of God and they don't believe he rose from the dead. Uh, and Muslim, the Muslim view of heaven or paradise, they do believe in a resurrection of the body, uh, just like Christians and Jewish believers as well. They believe in a resurrection of the body, but it's very focused on physical pleasures and physical or more sensual desires, whereas the biblical account of heaven focuses on being with the Lord, focuses more on a relationship with God and being in God's presence and worshiping him and being there. Uh, Muslims don't have the certainty of faith that Christians do. Uh, they do believe that God is gracious. They do believe that God is merciful. But there's not a certainty about his promises. So even though a, a devout Muslim may try very hard to do a lot of good works and try to live a good life and, and follow their religion perfectly, at the end of the day, when it comes time for them to die, it really depends on how God is feeling that day. Or kind of like what side of the bed he got up on. <laughs> Uh, it's really at his whims, and there's not a promise, there's not an assurance that they have. And so it's all up in the air, and they're very nervous about that. Uh, again, Christians can have an assurance on the promise of Jesus. You know, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. We have this promise of eternal life. Uh, John 3.16, right? Whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. It's a sure thing. Uh, Hindus, uh, we have a lot of uh, Indian neighbors in our community here and uh, a few Hindu temples in the Lansing area. Hindus believe in reincarnation where the person's soul or their existence uh, is simply reborn into a new life form. When you die, you just get reborn into a new existence. And, uh, and it's all based on karma, which is your, uh, the good works that you've done. If you're a good person, you have good karma, you're going to be reborn as a better life form or a better person. If you have bad karma, you've done a lot of bad things in your life, you're not so good, well, then you're going to be reborn as a lower life form. People go through different levels of human beings, from somebody who's really important, maybe wealthy, powerful, uh, whatever, but if they're bad, they get reborn as maybe a poor person, uh, an outcast, or uh, there's different levels of humanity that they put together for this reincarnation system. However, it goes lower than that. You might be reborn as an animal, as a dog or a cat. Uh, you can even be reborn as different kinds of soil. Uh, so it just keeps going down, 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 and you uh, come back as a, as a form of mineral or, or soil. So there's this constant reincarnation based on karma. It's the purest form of works righteousness uh, that a religion can have, right? When we, you know what I mean by works righteousness? If you do good works, you get rewarded. If you do bad things, you get punished. It's the purest form that that is. It has to be really uh, exhausting to think of how many times your life has to keep going until eventually, if you keep going up, 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 you're just going to be absorbed into the universe. That's kind of their goal. That's their heaven. You lose all your identity, your individuality, and you just become kind of one with the, the, the energy of the universe. And, and uh, uh, they describe it like a, a drop of water, a drop of liquid in the ocean and you're gone. You just dissipate. That's, that's, their, that's their hope or what they're looking forward to. Buddhists are a little different. Buddhists are more from China and Thailand and Eastern religions. Uh, they're looking at freeing yourself from pain and suffering by eliminating desire, getting rid of desire, getting rid of your, um, your wants, and kind of emptying yourself so that you can be free from suffering. And ultimately, you reach enlightenment, which is they call nirvana. Nirvana is enlightenment. And, uh, and when you die, Buddhists believe in a disintegration of the individual. 
you may, they may have some form of reincarnation, but, it, but it's not you anymore. It's just you are, you are gone and kind of disintegrate into the universe uh, when you die. Animists. Animists are like a spirit religion. This is what the Hmong people were before they became Christians. And some of our Hmong members of our congregation here at Our Savior were animists, and a lot of their relatives still are to this day. Animists believe in a spirit world where uh, there's a lot of spirits in trees and nature and so forth. And they believe that when people die, when their ancestors die, they go to a place of the dead and they call it the gray world. And it's actually quite gloomy there. And the ancestors who have died, um, if they are mad, upset, or cranky, they can actually mess with your life here on earth. They can meddle. In, in current affairs. And so there's quite a system that they have of trying to make sure that their dead, deceased ancestors have what they need to make them happy so that their life goes better here. So they can sacrifice animals, chickens and so forth, and sacrifice them and burn them, which is sending them up to the gray world. Uh, people in the gray world are also, if they're poor, they're gonna be suffering, so they need money. So the, you can actually purchase money, paper money, sacrificial money, that then their priest can burn on an altar, and that sends money, like an ATM, to, to, to your ancestors uh, to make sure that they have money to purchase whatever they need, whatever it takes to kind of make them happy. There's always this concern that the ancestors are restless or unhappy or suffering. So when a, a Christian when we have a Christian funeral for Hmong people. So when Pastor Yang does a service and the whole Hmong community comes, some of them are Christian, believers in Christ. Some of them are animist. And he's invited me to come and, and preach a number of times to different Hmong funerals. And he always says, now remember to tell them how wonderful heaven is. Because that's not the animist view. The animist view of their gray world is depressing, gloomy, sad, and it is a total contrast to talk about the joy and the, and the hope and the celebration that the Christian view is. It is drastically different. Uh, of course, uh, atheists are probably the most hopeless uh, and most uh, depressing view of all, and that is uh, as uh, their um, proponents have said, when you die, it's simply like just turning off the computer, blip, and everything ceases to exist uh, and is uh, purely meaningless, right? Absolutely no meaning to life, no purpose, no future, no hope. As I said, probably the most depressing and gloomy of, of any view out there. So um, those are all the different al alternatives. And, and Christianity stands in such stark contrast to so many of these other faiths and philosophies. Christians boldly profess I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. We have Easter, our own Easter, to look forward to. And Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 25, he said, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even if he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We have a living, risen Savior. And this, this was really you know, seen and demonstrated by Jesus' life. Um, this one fill in the blank here, this first fill in the blank, all of Jesus' miracles show what will happen to the body in the kingdom of God. Jesus came, and as he was conducting his earthly ministry, he literally healed the sick. He made lame people physically stand up and walk. He actually opened the eyes of the blind, and he made the mute be able to speak. He unstopped the ears of the deaf. Uh, people were, were dancing. He cleanses the lepers, right? And he actually raises people from the dead as well. All of these miracles that Jesus did. Now, if Jesus' purpose was only to be a healer, he could have just set up his little shop in Galilee, the line would have been out the door, and he could have spent the next 2,000 years just 
healing people in their physical bodies, one after another, constantly. That, of course, was not his mission. So why does he do the miracles? Why does he do those things? Every miracle Jesus does is a demonstration of what's going to happen in the kingdom of God. That our physical bodies are going to be restored. We're going to be healed. We are going to be made well. And we are going to be made whole. And that can only happen if our sins are forgiven and we're made right with God and we have Jesus' resurrection power, his life-giving power in us. And that's exactly what happens for believers in Christ, especially in our baptism. And we'll get to that. As we're doing some of this uh, background and some different philosophies, I did want to mention one uh, kind of philosophy and worldview to look at. And this one's called Gnosticism. Here's your big technical theological word of the day, okay? Uh, it's, it's not Latin, and I don't know that I have a Latin phrase for you today. I apologize. Uh, maybe next week we can get a Latin phrase going. But uh, this, our, our big technical word of the day is Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was a, uh, a religious and philosophical movement in the ancient Greek world that shows up in a couple different religions and even affected Christianity in some ways. Uh, Gnosticism tried to adapt Christianity to its, its philosophy. And what the Gnostics were is they were, uh, they kind of separated the universe and and they saw the physical world and the spiritual world. But they valued the spiritual world so much that they said that the spiritual world is the ultimate reality and the physical world is basically worthless. It's just a temporary passing shell and the goal of A person is to escape the physical world and get into the spiritual realm. And that's even this diagram that you see here. You see a person in the physical world with plants and trees and they're trying to break through to the the spiritual world which is beyond all of that. So they really valued the spiritual over the physical world to the extreme. Uh, and uh, in, in a really extreme way. And this is sometimes called a platonic dualism, uh, named after Plato. Uh, Gnosticism reduced the physical world and the physical body to trappings that the soul must escape. It denies the goodness of the physical creation and the physical body. So they wanted so badly to escape the physical world and get to the spiritual world that they even said the physical world is all bad creation is bad, the body is bad, all of these physical realities are bad. And why does that not jive with a Christian worldview? Think about that. Yeah, Jake? God created instead of the spirit? Yes! God created the physical universe the world, plants and trees, fish and things that swim in the sea, birds that fly in the air, things that creep and crawl around the ground. And every day after creation, God looks what he had made and he said, it is good, right? And he looks back and he sees it all and he says, it is very good. No, a Christian view does not see creation or the physical world as bad or things that need to be escaped. Uh, What's wrong with the world, what's wrong with creation You know, after God created everything and he said it was very good, what happened? Well, sin entered the world, right? We messed it up. Human beings rebelled against God. They broke that relationship with God. They turned against him. And that brought sin, death, destruction, and all those consequences into the world. So the Christian worldview doesn't say that the physical world, that we need to escape it or like get rid of it all. The Christian view says how do we deal with sin? How do we get right with God? How do we get back into that loving relationship with him as our heavenly father? And that's going to take care of our problem of death and destruction. And that, of course, God's plan to do that all is through sending his son who would die and rise again so that we might live in him. So these are some big kind of heady concepts, some different spiritual views Uh, that may affect people's views of the afterlife. And I bring up the Gnosticism one because this is one, even though it's like 2,000 years old, it's it's still with us today. There still tends to be, um, uh, especially in Western thought, 
this desire to kind of see the spiritual as the most important thing and the physical as bad or something that needs to be escaped. Uh, that can happen sometimes when Christians overemphasize maybe, I'm just ready to leave this life. I'm just ready to get to heaven, which we are, which we are. But maybe they portray heaven as like floating on puffy clouds with a harp. And, and, uh, and, and heaven really takes more of this spiritual existence rather than something that's very physical. Or when they treat the body to say, well, that's not me. My body isn't me. My, my real me is my soul. It's my spirit, right? And, and, and uh, to say, well, the physical body, that's not me. Well, what do you mean that's not you? Of course that's you. That's your body. You are your body. Your soul and your body are put together, and that's what makes you you. Uh, so again, a Christian view affirms the goodness of creation and the physical body. Okay, what does Jesus' resurrection say about our bodies? If we're going to keep grounding this all in Jesus' resurrection from the dead, here's three points, and these are some fill-in-the-blanks on the worksheet. First of all, our bodies are valuable to God. God creates the created world. He created Adam and Eve, and he said, it is good. And again, the miracles, the healing miracles of Jesus affirm the value of our human bodies to the Lord. Um, he cared for people. He healed them. He is the great physician. Um, that's why we should have doctors and nurses and hospitals. And it's no surprise, most of those in olden times were started by Christians, right? The church. The church was in the hospital business. The church was in healing ministries. The church was in things where they valued the human body and wanted to care for it and help it in whatever ways we could. Our bodies are valuable to God. Uh, the Bible talks about us being made, created in the image of God. Created in the image of God. And of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, God's got fingers and toes and, uh, you know, joints and things like that. But, but we're still creating the image of God with this ability to love and, and to care and to be you know, connected with God. But I think our physical bodies are a part of that image as well, that we should treat our bodies as also as being connected to God or valuable to the Lord. Uh, secondly, our bodies are redeemed by Christ. There's certainly truth to the phrase, Jesus saves our soul, right? My soul's been redeemed. Jesus saved my soul. And that is true. But it's only half of the story. Because you are not just a soul. You are a soul and a body. And Jesus is going to redeem both. He's going to save our souls by taking care of the problem of sin. And he's going to save our bodies by his resurrection and giving us his resurrection power so that we will rise again to eternal life. And so our bodies are also redeemed by Christ. Um, when Jesus rose from the dead, he has to tell his disciples on a number of occasions, doesn't he? Touch me and feel me. See, uh, a, a ghost does not have flesh and bones like you see I have. Uh, one time Jesus says to them, because uh, I think they still just were like incredulous. They just couldn't believe it, right? They couldn't believe that it was really him. So he looks around and he says, you guys got something to eat around here? And, uh, uh, and he eats it in their presence. He, like Basically like, watch, watch this. And he eats it. It's actually him. It's his physical body raised from the dead. Um, there's a few of the Easter accounts where it talks about Mary and the women reaching down and clasping his feet. And, and, and even Thomas falls at Jesus' feet. And when Jesus' feet are mentioned, in the resurrection accounts. That's because in, uh, in, the, in the first century, ghosts don't have feet. They just kind of hover and float around. So the fact that Jesus had feet that you could hold on to or touch was again just more proof that it was him raised from the dead. So if Jesus' body is raised from the tomb, and that's a, a prefigurement of our body, uh, our bodies too will be raised. Our bodies are going to come to life. Our bodies are going to be restored. The only difference between Jesus' body and our resurrected bodies is Jesus is going to carry his scars. He's going to keep those. Our bodies, when they're healed, when they're restored, 
you know, to be fullness, to be fully restored. We just can't imagine how, how, what that's going to be like. Jesus is going to keep his scars, the nail marks in his hands, the hole in his side, and that's going to be eternally these symbols of how much he loved us and what it took for him to save us and redeem us. And won't it be an amazing thing for us as the redeemed and resurrected people of God to, uh, to do uh, at his invitation, just like Thomas, reach out, touch his hands, feel his side. This is really him, and this is what he did to save us and redeem us. So our bodies are valuable to God. They are redeemed by Christ. And then thirdly here, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Uh, This is particularly uh, a verse in, in 1 Corinthians where Paul is talking about how Christians treat their bodies. Um, And it can be expanded to uh, different foods or you know, exercise or health, kind of physical health in general. But he was specifically talking about sexual immorality. Christians have a, an incredibly high sexual ethic because we value the human body more than any other religion or, or faith. Uh, so when Paul was talking about that, he says, you know, shall I unite the members of Christ with a prostitute? May it never be. Let's not treat our bodies that way. But our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. He says, you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And so when Paul's talking about that, honor God with our body, yeah, we can't expand that to other, other areas just in terms of health and wellness and how we treat our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. They belong to the Lord. Okay, next uh, passage I want to look at is the great resurrection chapter of the Bible. And uh, we'll just kind of spend a few minutes on this. We're not going to read through it all or be able to go through it all. We just, uh, that would be another three weeks, uh, which would be awesome. And uh, we'll do that when we do a study on 1 Corinthians again. But I know we've looked at this passage before and, and a lot of this will be familiar to you. So it's really just to kind of review it and look at what it has to say about our understanding of resurrection life and a what do we do with the body uh, at death. 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter of the Bible, the entire chapter, and it's quite long. How many verses are in there? Where's the last verse? Can you find that? How many verses does it have? 58. That is a long chapter, but it all has one unifying theme, and that is the resurrection of the dead. And you can kind of break the chapter up into three main parts. Uh, The first part talks about how Christ's resurrection is foundational to the Christian faith. It's not optional. It's not a theory. It's like foundational to what Christians believe. And in the first few verses of chapter 15, this is Paul's account of Easter morning. He gives an account of the resurrection of Jesus, which is of first importance. And take a look at verse 3. In verse 3, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Does that kind of sound familiar? Does that sound like something? What's that sound like? The creed, yeah, that's our creed, right? Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, these are the basics of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now, verse five, he gives us some really cool details here. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, Paul's letter to the first Corinthians was most likely written before the Gospels. He's writing them what they already know. He's telling them what they've already heard. The Easter, the resurrection accounts of Jesus and how he appeared to Peter, to the twelve, and then, and this is not recorded in the Gospels, how Jesus appeared to 500, over 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, Paul says. You can ask them. Talk to them about it. They are eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Uh, An amazing uh, Uh, pronouncement of faith and and a claim there. So the first part talking about Christ's resurrection uh, is foundational. 
and he describes Jesus as the first fruits uh, of the dead. And let's see, the first fruits of the dead. What does it mean that Jesus is the first fruits? What are first fruits? Remember that terminology? That's Old Testament language, right, isn't it? Uh, in the sacrifices, they were to bring their first fruits. What are the first fruits? Yeah, the, the first part of the harvest, the first thing to come in. If you guys have a garden or if you guys have done any vegetables this year, uh, you're just waiting and waiting. And when you get that first ripe tomato or that first cucumber that comes off the vine, right, there's something special about that one. And that is the first fruits, and that's what the Israelites were to give to the Lord as a, as a sacrifice, as a gift to the Lord, to the temple. And when they gave of their first fruits, it was an act of faith and trust. Because if they give God their first fruits, the first of the harvest, the first ripe apples, the first uh, that, that's coming in, what are, they, what are they trusting God for? That the rest of the harvest is going to come in, Right? The rest, it's an act of faith and trust in the Lord. You give God your first fruits, that's an act of faith. Uh, the, the alternative is to um, wait for everything to come in and then see what's left over and then give that to the Lord. And, and that's the difference between giving God our leftovers versus giving God our first fruits and giving him first. So if Jesus is the first fruits of those uh, awakened from the dead, what do we believe? The rest of the harvest is going to come in. The rest of the people are going to be brought in and resurrected just like he was. And so Christ is the first fruits. Um, in verse 26, in verse 26, he says, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And the Bible, even though as Christians, we can look forward to heaven, we can look forward to eternal life, we can long for that, right? And, and, and we've known people that have been at a certain point in their life where they just say, I'm ready, I'm ready. And, and yet, at the same time, death is always an enemy. Death is always the enemy. And uh, it will be ultimately destroyed. It will be swallowed up forever. That is the final enemy that will be wiped out. Death will pass away, as it said in Revelation, as we looked at that, um, because death is not how God intended it originally to be. Okay, the next part is really fascinating in this chapter, and this is beginning at verse 35. Beginning at verse 35. People wondered, what is the resurrected body going to look like? And they kind of started speculating about it. And so some were speculating it about it, uh, maybe honestly or in a thoughtful way. Others were speculating about it in a way that wasn't making any sense. Or maybe even in a negative way, saying, how could a body ever rise from the dead? That sounds preposterous, which people may say today. Uh, and so he addresses some of these different things where he talks about how the, the resurrected body is going to go from the perishable to the imperishable, from dishonor to glory, from weakness to power, from a natural body to a spiritual body. It's going to go from dust to heaven. And our resurrected body is going to be glorified. The way I like to summarize that section of Scripture there is that our resurrected bodies, uh, it will be us, but different. That's about all we can say, right? It'll be you, but it'll be different. And, you know, there's some different ways to think about that. What, uh, as we talked about before, what, what would our bodies look like if they were full grown, but showed not a single hint of aging? Do we even get to that point in our lives? I don't think we do. I think we overlap somewhere in our 20s or 30s, right? Where we're still kind of growing or maturing, but that aging starts to set in. What would, it, what would our bodies look like without a hint of the weakness or illness or aches or pains or, again, any of that aging process to be perfectly freed from that? We can only imagine, right? We can't, we can't hardly imagine what that would look like. So, Another way to think about it is when Jesus rises from the dead, since he's kind of our example, you know how a, lot of, a number of times Jesus appears, but they don't recognize him right away? 
and it takes a little time, right? Mary's crying in the garden. She hears Jesus, but he thinks he's the gardener until he says her name. She looks at him and she realizes it's him. Uh, the, the guy's walking on the road to Emmaus, and this is more intentional. I think this is God specifically hiding Jesus' identity from them. But, but they still, it takes some time, and then when he breaks the bread, their eyes are open and they realize him. And then when Jesus is walking along the shore and the disciples are fishing, it's almost they have this debate about him if it's really him. And Peter says, no, it's the Lord. And he jumps in the water and he swims to shore. And then they're eating fish over the fire. And, and it, there's a verse that says some were wanted to ask him if it was really him. So do you see how it really is Jesus, but something's different about him? And, and I think maybe our resurrected bodies will be like that too, where you're going to see someone and you won't recognize them right away, and all of a sudden you're going to look at them and you're going to be like, Tom, is that you? It is. Wow. <laughs> and it's going to be more of that realization because it's really them, but it was, they're so different, we've been changed. So this is probably the closest to a description of our resurrected bodies that we get in this chapter 15, and that's an important one to serve as our foundation. Uh, the last section of this is, uh, is an amazing conclusion to the chapter, and that begins, I think, at verse 50, where, um, well, let me just kind of read this section, because here we're going to get into the end now, and, but I want to just kind of go through these words. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality." When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying is written, will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he concludes with how we should live now in light of that. And maybe this should be our our kind of concluding thought here for today. Uh, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. If our hope is resurrection life, if our glory is yet to come, uh, the best that's yet to come, we get to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We get to abound with hope each and every day, right? Uh, it is the day that the Lord has made and we get to rejoice and be glad in it. And that's our solid foundation as we go through our life, knowing that this life is not all there is and in the grand scheme of things, this life isn't even the big deal, right? The big deal is the, the life to come and this life is getting us ready for that. So that's our, that's our Christian hope that we want to stand firmly on, solidly on, and profess, especially when we come together as we uh, grieve and mourn, but, uh, but with hope. The last section on the handout, uh, there's some verses there that talk again about the resurrection of the dead from Revelation 19, from Daniel chapter 12, Job 19, uh, I think what's interesting in Daniel 12 is it says, many who are sleeping in the dust of the ground will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Um, let me just put this question out there just so we can get this done and, and dealt with too. Can God raise ashes from the dead? Should there be any doubt about that? No. And that, that is a question that some people ask and, you know, and, and is a genuine one. Can God raise ashes? And the answer is, of course he can, right? Of course he can. Uh, even it says there in Daniel 12, those who sleep in the dust of the ground, right? From uh, dust you, you came and from dust you shall return. Uh, it specifically says dust. And so we can have a, a very confident answer to that question. Can God raise ashes from the dead? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Nothing will stop uh, Jesus from raising up 
the faithful. Nothing will stop the Lord from raising up uh, his people, calling them out of the earth, calling them out of the dust, and raising up and restoring their bodies to new and lasting and eternal life. Uh, Job 19 says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the end of time he will stand over the dust. Then even after my skin has been destroyed, nevertheless, in my own flesh, I will see God, a resurrection of the body. I myself will see him, uh, my own eyes, and how awesome will that be? Okay, to summarize and close it up here, our uh, last few little fill-in-the-blanks. What happens when we die? This is our, our Christian view here. Our bodies and souls are separated. That's not supposed to happen, but that's what death is. Our bodies and soul are separated. Our bodies decay and turn to dust. From dust you are, from dust you shall return, right? Ash Wednesday, remember that you are dust. And our souls rest with the Lord. And next week we'll talk about more what that means exactly and what that looks like. Our souls rest with the Lord. But that's not the end of the story. Number four, we await the day of resurrection. And we think of in Revelation when we saw the uh, vision of the souls under the altar crying out, How long, O Lord? How long? When, when is this going to all wrap up? When is the great day coming? When this is all going to be restored? We await the day of resurrection. So those are some of our basic foundational points. All right, well, uh, next week we'll talk more specifically about some of our customs and practices of cremation, of the memorial garden, and how does our faith and all those things that we talked about today now come to fruition and, and are lived out in our, in our faith and different uh, faith practices that we have. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer and then uh, we can conclude our time together here. Lord God, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for you are the Lord of life. Uh, you created this earth and everything in it and you sustain it by your powerful word. Everything that is alive, everything that has the breath of life in it uh, comes from you, Lord, and is sustained by you. We thank you for the earthly life that we get to live in this body, uh, for the days that you have allotted to us. And we also thank you, Lord, that because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we have that promise of eternal life with you, resurrection life as the people of God. And uh, Lord, uh, we can't wait for that day to worship and praise you, uh, to sing and dance in your presence, Lord, especially with those who've gone before us. Until that day, help us to be fully devoted to your work and to live each day with your presence and peace in our hearts. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. God's blessings. Have a great rest of the day.